asking you to get paid what the men get paid. We're asking you to get paid the same percentage of revenue shared. Okay. Do you know uh, what I'm got saying? It, got it, got so it. that's a huge misconception. That's a huge misconception. Yeah, got it. Okay, for sure. Yeah, because every video is like, oh, this person gets paid this, this, this no. person gets paid yeah. that, right? So I want to be really clear about that. Like, I don't think I, I should get paid the same as LeBron. Right. But the percentage of revenue, like, for example, they sell my jersey in Mandalay Bay. I don't get a dime. You don't get any money from jersey sales? That's crazy. The, in the NBA, um, they have percentages of revenue shared for the players, right? right. So jersey yeah. sales, obviously. Wait, what the hell's going on? We begin tonight with the dramatic prisoner swap playing out on the world stage today. That's Brittany Griner, star of the Phoenix Mercury, a team in the Women's National Basketball Association, more commonly referred to as the WNBA. She's also the subject of a trade, not with another team, but another country. This guy, Victor Boot, nicknamed the Merchant of Death, is being sent back to Russia in order to free Griner from her prison sentence. The Griner saga brought some new attention on the younger, often overshadowed basketball league. And with that came calls for change. Critics like Kelsey Plum, who you heard at the beginning of the video, alleged that fair treatment of WNBA players would have avoided the Griner situation entirely. You see, about half of WNBA players play in another league during the offseason to supplement their salary, usually for more money than the WNBA pays. Griner's first season in Russia a few years ago netted her almost a million dollars, four times the max salary for a WNBA player. So was this situation really avoidable? Well, yeah, of course, she could have not brought hash oil or the Russian government could have updated its archaic drug laws, but that's besides the point. I also want to make a disclaimer before I jump into this video. I'm sure just the title of this video got many people to come in with pre-established beliefs in mind. To be clear, there is no place for sexism or hate in sports or our society, and we should treat everyone with the respect and kindness that we expect. Alright, so let's look at how the WNBA got the way it is now. The WNBA was approved and founded by the NBA Board of Governors in 1996, and after successfully outlasting another rival women's basketball league, the ABL, there were high hopes to start for the eight founding teams. The early years of the WNBA were interesting. Not only did the NBA own every team, but the same team won the first four titles, a feat that has only happened once in the entire history of the NBA. In 2002, however, teams were sold off, many to their much larger NBA counterparts. Four years after that, the WNBA became the first team-oriented women's sports league to last at least a decade. But if they're truly all these amazing players and these incredible moments, what is the problem? Why does a WNBA player make a 40th of an NBA player? Notice that Kelsey Plum mentions revenue sharing and not profit sharing. This is because the WNBA team loses about $2 million each season on average. Put shortly, the NBA is artificially keeping the WNBA afloat. This point, however, that the WNBA needs the NBA to support it so we should let it fail is a little bit flawed because there are a plethora of small market NBA teams that are constantly in the red and need bigger market teams like the Lakers or the Knicks to subsidize their inferior financial performance. And this is also not to say that the WNBA brings no value. By 2013, half of teams had a positive cash flow, but still. Attendance decreased and in 2015 it was the lowest since the inception of the league, with noticeable drops in 2018 and 2019. New York Liberty owner and renowned band musician James Dolan noted that a staggering half of all fans that attended were given complimentary tickets. Advocates, however, like WNBA star Sue Bird, argue that if given even a fraction of the resources male professional sports leagues have, such as marketing, highlight reels on ESPN, and of course, higher salaries, it would allow them to rest in the offseason, and as a result, the WNBA would thrive as an alternative way to watch the sport we all know and love. But the present fact is that it's not thriving. In fact, without the NBA, it might not even exist at all. So now, here we are at the present. To limit the scope of this video, I'd like to answer two questions. Number one, are WNBA players compensated fairly? And number two, is the WNBA, as it stands today, a lackluster product? Let's start with the first question. Now, just because a business is failing doesn't magically mean employees shouldn't be paid what the market deems fair. Ultimately, the players are not shareholders, they're employees. Still, many hold that WNBA players are lucky to have contracts at all. They're in no position to negotiate for lavish increases when their league is not drawing in the same quality or quantity that the NBA is. But it would be deceiving to say that sex has nothing to do with it. Unfortunately for our analysis, there are just not that many sports leagues. 
but an interesting case study I'd like to explore is Major League Soccer or MLS. To the surprise of many, MLS and the WNBA have very similar viewership, but MLS, a male league, has vastly better compensation for its players. The article listed also includes esports as a comparison, but I'm not convinced that's an apt one for this scenario. This all comes down to sponsorships, which usually make up a significant amount of sports revenue. The NBA and MLS get more money in these deals than the WNBA does on a per viewer basis. To reiterate, this is bizarre. For every one NBA viewer, sponsors pay nearly nine times more money than someone else watching a WNBA game. A possible marketing answer to this is a phenomena called the conversion rate, which essentially means how much money a viewer spends from a particular ad. However, I'm not really convinced that the disparity between an NBA and WNBA viewer is 900%. Because when you think about these two demographics, they're probably the same person. Whether this is because the WNBA is a women's only league is very difficult to prove. But what would benefit everyone is to think of ways we can make it better. So is the WNBA as it stands today a lackluster product? Well, products are subjective. But for me, the WNBA is not as enjoyable of an experience as a standard NBA game. And this is coming from someone who's been to multiple WNBA games. Whether anyone likes it, Dr. Naismith, a man, invented the game of basketball for his all-male gym class and it's evident. With the rule set mainly unchanged, WNBA players have to work around confines that are intended to reward a traditional male athlete. Now, to be clear, none of this is to say that the NBA rulebook is any more sexist than gymnastics or NASCAR. But instead, I believe that we should celebrate the athletic diversity of the players. It took over five years for someone to dunk in the WNBA. That's because the height of the basket is exactly the same as it is in the NBA. So lower it. The WNBA is much more team oriented and less individualistic than the NBA. So introduce a passing contest. I'd love to see some wacky rules like a four point line, maybe a penalty box like they do in hockey. And could you imagine they put two basketballs at the same time in? I'd watch that. This isn't to make the WNBA a joke. I think it would make it more entertaining and impressive in ways completely separate from the NBA. And most of all, it would be fun. Well, I, I guess most of all, it would hopefully keep players out of Russian prison. <laughs>